Hello and welcome. Campbell here from Autodidactic and I have with me today Michelle Gibson, someone that you all know and we're going to have a bit of a chat on Michelle's um, research to, to do with the, the old world grid system and we actually spent what was it three weeks almost together traveling through the Balkans and going to pyramids and all this type of stuff there'll be a bit of content from that as well so welcome Michelle. Thank you Campbell it's great to be here. All right so what are we going to be talking about today Michelle? I thought I'd do a presentation that is based on one that I had compiled for giving on the trip and unfortunately the opportunity to give it didn't uh, happen. It, there was just a lot going on and not a lot of time. And so um, we talked on the trip even about coming on the show and covering some of the things that I was going to talk about. And so you've given me the opportunity to do that today. And it was such a pleasure meeting you and Kelly. And I'm really glad we had the chance to meet in the physical yeah, yeah, it was great. It's it's great when you get to meet people in, in the flesh rather than just seeing them on a screen, isn't it? You know, we had a great time over there. Yeah, I'm I'm interested because we had a bit of a, a chat about your you know your grid systems and things. I'm so I have a few questions. I'm very interested in what you think the train's role was. <laughs> so um, yeah, feel free if you want to share screen whenever. Just let's jump into it when when you're ready. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to share it and then I just want to address that last statement um, real quick. Because... Yeah, it really got me thinking when because I hadn't thought about trains as being part of the grid system. But when you mentioned it, I thought, well, metal tracks with big metal trains, machines rolling around going to stations and are they carrying some kind of charge or, or yeah, I'm not sure what, what your thoughts on. We didn't get that deep on it, but definitely interested Very to hear. Much so. Very much so. I, I th think that they were pre-existing. I think they were part of the free energy generating system. The trains, the bridges, the waterways, the star forts, uh, lighthouses, cathedrals, all the buildings with the domes and the spires, the beautiful architecture was, was all functional. Yeah. And my research has led me deep down this road of the physical infrastructure of the grid system. And I started with ley lines. When I started my, doing this research and blogging and creating videos in June of 2018 was when it started for me. I started with ley lines. And I started yeah. with an advanced civilization that was worldwide and based on sacred geometry. Yep. I still remember that Very video where you showed that. the star on, on America. That was the start of it all, wasn't it? That, that was my beginning into all of this and the only reason i'm sitting here today and have anything to say <laughs> is following my intuition and um i i really believe that i came here to do this work um, because there's no reason for me to know any of this <laughs> i grew up in a suburban mid middle class family my parents were teachers didn't have a lot of money but weren't poor um, decent experiences growing up, uh, good education, but nothing like any of this stuff. <laughs> it wasn't even a thought in my head, and no. it's not even something I can talk to my family about because it's like, so what are you talking about? <laughs> um, this came from living a very different life, making different choices from m most people, unplugging from the matrix, and and basically charting my own path in my life. And um, making decisions that were different from most people. Um, where I lived, who I married, uh, jobs that I had, I I never had to be a certain way or do things a certain way. And and that I think opened me up to being receptive to this information. Um, so even though when I was in the school system growing up. I was a good student, you know, wanted to do well. And, you know, I probably had some beginnings there. Um, you know, I don't know if this is accurate, but, you know, if, as autodidactic, I, I don't know if you started your questioning from the beginning. 
pretty much. <laughs> yeah, like like my my first thought that I can remember was literally come back and get me. You've dropped me in the wrong place. Like I just I, I did not feel like I was part of this world or you know everyone was just weird to me I didn't understand why they did what they did why people lied and pretended to be you know people they weren't it just I was I was I say that when I was young I studied confusionism because I was very confused (laughs) (laughs) and I don't think I started my really deep questioning until much later um I was certainly aware of a lot of different things but I didn't really start waking up to things aren't what we were told until I was probably probably the early 2000s. So in the last 20 years or so. Is the real beginning of my waking up to the lies about what where we live and what's really in the environment around us. and And that's been in many ways, an intuitive and synchronistic journey. And so my research along the ley lines led me to seeing the same kinds of things in many different places. And you know, the calling rivers, can, or calling canals rivers, which is pretty typical. You see masonry banks, but they're yeah. natural. But, yeah. oh, there's a couple of canals here and there that they built in the 1700s, 1800s. But you still have like the River Clyde in uh, Glasgow and Scotland and the River Thames in England. Oh, they're natural. Yep. Even the Swan River in Perth. You know, you've got these S shapes with masonry banks. It's like, okay. Hmm. Um, But they controlled the narrative for so long, they got away with it and removed critical thinking and all the things that would cause people to question. Mm. But they were told. I still and remember so, when I realized that rivers were canals. I, I was just like, <laughs> I was looking at old maps and that, and then I looked at Perth where I was living and and our Swan River had, you know, and Perth is like 150 years old or something and masonry banks all up the river. And I was just like, oh, my God, all rivers are actually man-made canals. What's it like? Well, the vast majority of them. I, I, I think they pretty much are. Um, in many cases, the stones have been obscured or removed, um, but that, you know that's pretty much all over the earth. Mm. And so um, I started noticing railroads that are parallel to the canals, rivers, whatever. Um, Waterways. And so there's a connection between the rivers, canals, railroads, and all this other infrastructure, hydro plants. And then there's this tendency to, oh, we don't need the trains anymore. We've got cars and buses now. So therefore, we're going to take the tracks out. And then they replace them with recreational trails, for example. Yeah. And what they've done is they have replaced the infrastructure of the free energy generating system, which would include what we've been talking about, the rail, the bridges, the canals with our energy. So they removed the rails. They, the, a lot of places that had streetcars now have roads on top of them and they have cars and people, you know, all that energy was switched over from the in, energy transference of the railroads to covering that up and replacing it with our hectic, chaotic human energy and then the cars and, and whatnot. Mm. So it's, been this intentional replacement and somebody somewhere is benefiting from this energy grid system yeah yeah for sure (laughs) and so um i'm gonna go through the slides that i have starting with what i noticed on the on the trip and this was one of the first places that we went in novi sad serbia and it's the petro varadin fortress um, so we crossed over this bridge, and I noticed the railroad right going right across with oh, us. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's the train and, on the bridge there, is it? Yeah, okay. And so, like, ding, here we go. <laughs> um, so I find these railroads in conjunction with the Star Forts, and I believe that 
the rail infrastructure was an important part of the energy grid system, that they functioned together with the star forts, which functioned as some kind of battery, likely along with other purposes, and both were part of an integrated system of free energy, uh, or let's say free energy generation and transmission that included architecture that existed worldwide. And star forts are often called batteries, but in association with a military function instead of an energy function. Mm. Yep. And of course, all the all the um, soldiers charge out of their batteries, don't they? <laughs> and then when you leave, you get discharged. The electrical references in our everyday language blow one's mind. You've got charge cards, you've got circuits, all different kinds of circuits. You've got racing circuits, you've got circuit courts. You know, when yeah. somebody is arrested, they are charged. There's a reason for that. Mm. Yeah, and when we elect <laughs> someone to, to be our leader, we put them in charge. There's There's definitely energy harvesting going on here. Mm. And I've believed that for a long time, but I'm getting deeper into the evidence to support that in my research and in collaboration with other people that I'm researching with. Um, so if you look at one of the definitions of battery, it's a device that produces electricity that may have several primary or secondary cells arranged in parallel or series, as well as the battery source of energy, which provides a push or a voltage of energy to get the current flowing in a circuit. And so typically I found star forts in pairs and clusters all over the world. So it was interesting that our tour guide we got a tour underneath and that was kind of an interesting experience because he had his Pat story and he was with a group of people that had a uh, far greater awareness of these kinds of things than most of us tour groups, I'm sure. <laughs> but yeah. I have no doubt he believed every word that he said and it was actually kind of humorous. Oh. Um, <laughs> but he said that um, at one time, and I don't if you remember this, there was another fort across the river. Yeah but it's not there anymore. Yeah. There's also almost 10 miles of underground corridors here, which is 16 kilometers of tunnels underneath the fortress. Now, when I look at the tunnels here, I'm reminded strongly of tunnels that I've seen all over, again, North America, but other places as well. You know, you, you have the same kind of brickwork. Yep. Always. Very sophisticated. And they want us to believe that these tunnels were built by, you know, laborers, slaves. Um, yeah, the town folk, farmers. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. You know, unskilled people. Yeah, unskilled. Prisoners a lot of times. And so what's interesting about this fortress here in Serbia is that the tour guide said it was built starting in 1692 and completed in 1780. And when I looked it up, it was said to have been constructed by slave labor. And so from Google Earth, this is what it looks like. And it's the largest star, star fort I think I've ever seen. It is, it is, isn't it? It's huge. <laughs> it's huge. And it's like the second largest in Europe. I couldn't find the largest. It was the second largest. Yeah. And I, I put the port, the star fort portage next to it in the Netherlands because it reminded me of it. And it was the largest one I could think of. And it's probably two or three size, uh, two or three times the size of the one in Serbia. But there's similar features. Yeah. And... So the Fort Portange was said to have been built between 1568 and 1593. So mid to late 1500s. Again, where is the technology coming from to build these places? The narrative falls way short in providing a believable explanation when you start looking at these things critically. Instead of following the official narrative, like we heard at the star fort in serbia 
where we're going down these long hallways and there's these little teeny tiny windows <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know they're they're long they're long and narrow and and then they they go long distance through the wall you can't i mean if you're going to stick a gun down there you can't see what you're shooting at no that, but that's and what that's they're for the apparently yeah that was the story <laughs> guns that's the story they're they're gun holes it's like are you kidding me <laughs> it, it was hilarious because we got into one part of it and those holes suddenly started going up and then bent sideways and it's like they're gun holes are they okay that, that's a pretty interesting gun that can shoot around a corner <laughs> you know and then you know in these little nooks and crannies they had these soldiers and uh, cut out yeah, yeah, cut yeah. out cannon and things like that and you know so they're pushing this story hard and uh you know it wasn't used very much <laughs> maybe one or two battles something like that and and so the this is the the railroad bridge here that was in the first slide i showed you yeah and You've got the the rail tr road tracks going around this way. Whoops, sorry. Going around this way, and it does connect. There is a railroad that connects Belgrade with Novi Sad. Okay. And I was looking at that. I'm. They've done some reworking of the original rails, and so my my feeling is there would have been some kind of railroad going along the river, and this is the Danube River. And there are examples of that that we saw in the places that we traveled to. Mm. Um, but they they've reworked a lot of things so that it's not exactly like it was originally. And yeah. then they give us the more recent construction stories. And so um, I wanted to give the example of, you know, these are kind of similar in design and these are just two examples of the same idea that you can find in a lot of different places all over the earth. And again, they want us to believe it was built locally for a particular purpose, but it doesn't explain how this place in Serbia looks like a place in the Netherlands. And there's almost 782 miles or 1,258 kilometers between the two of them. Yeah, you know how are they getting around in the 1500s and 1600s, sharing this information? Of this is how you build a military fortification based on what we've been told about our history, which was pretty basic. Mm. Uh, I think that was before the horse and buggy. That was probably just the horse, <laughs> horse and carriage, or or whatever they're they're going with. Yep, yep. That and I have those old... canals by hand. <laughs> yes. And I have a lot of doubts about the history we've been told about anything, but you know, this is just an example of how things don't match. Yeah. How in the world are they pulling these amazing engineering and construction feats off with the techno the low technology they were supposed to have had at that time? Hmm. And and they all turn out perfect. Like we've got no examples of star forts that went wrong or didn't get completed or anything and, and they're all built for war apparently but like the amount of stuff what you can find that have actually been used in a conflict is i don't think i've found any yet like there's a few they kind of say there's a bits around them but so the story just doesn't make sense at all and we certainly didn't get a feel for how big this place was when we were there because they just had us in one little part yeah and I could look down and I mean, I could see the, the points going off in all kinds of different directions. And I was really intrigued by that, but that it was this big it didn't even occur to me. Yeah, I know it's, yeah, we were basically just up in one little part of it. Um, I guess we were up in the, the left part maybe, but even up the top I, there, that, that was all, side. yeah, I think we we're up there somewhere, but. Yeah, there, so were, there were mud here. flood buildings up the top of it, you know, the old red, you know, red, the same sort of mark as we see everywhere, but it was definitely, it looked like it had been mud flooded at some point. But right. there, there was one building and literally just the ceiling was coming out of the ground and the door always went into a hill. It was just, it was strange. And, 
and those are the kinds of things what you're describing I see all over the place and I have come to the conclusion that there was some kind of directed attack through the grid system and that that's why you see that type of damage not just here but you also see it uh the estuaries and swamps and bogs and deserts and dunes and you know I, I think that was all part of it and and i do remember the tour guides saying that there were marshes here yeah. and so i think that's I, I think the grid was blown out is what i've come to the conclusion and, and that's why we see these strange effects like short-circuited basically and, and yeah and just blew it out. I mean, just destroyed the surface of the earth. The the grid just went haywire. And what was perfectly tuned and working together as a free energy generating system got, you know, basically destroyed. It destroyed itself. Yeah. When the grid was destroyed, it took out everything else. And so um, you see, I see the same mud flood effects in this part of the world that I see in my part of the world. And at this point, I would expect to see it everywhere, but now I look for it. Whereas before, I, I'm, you know, like everybody else, it's just the way it is. But they they built, <laughs> they built these buildings <laughs> in strange places. Uh, that must be it. And then yeah. you start seeing differently, and it really changes the perspective a lot. Well, in Australia, we have little towns everywhere that have got these buildings and these same trolley systems the train tracks or you know the tunnels the arch roofs of the mud flooded buildings and and you find them out in the middle of nowhere you know with these tiny population towns and yeah big red brick buildings and all this infrastructure that they got no explanation for apart well the explanation is convicts pretty much in australia so that's pretty typical and again there's this is everywhere you can find this everywhere mm. and so this is one of the places we were just kind of hanging out at Petrovardin and those walls were massive. And what came to my mind was this Derwent Reservoir and Dam in England. It, I mean, it was what I thought of when I stood next to it was doing research on these hydroelectric or, or these facilities. Um, you know, again, the same, there's very sophisticated hydrology around the world masonry based in your part of the world as well mm -hmm. same kind of stories we built this 1800s early 1900s and this one uh, for example um, the derwent dam and reservoir were said to have been built between 1902 and 1914 and filled with water between 1914 and 1916 and that would have been during world war one which lasted from 1914 to 1918. So you have a lot of their construction dates happening during wartime or the depression. With war, like who built them, right? All, all the, the fit young men were either off at war or they were at home working for the war, basically. So who was building this? It, so it's, it's almost like they, they have too much infrastructure in too few years. <laughs> yeah, so whoever was rewriting the history you know they whether it's the masons or other secret societies and i'm i'm also pretty convinced that the freemasons the odd fellows the elks the woodmen of the world um they were all part of this yeah the reset history they were the ones that came in and made everything livable and usable again um there may have been others involved, but the secret societies like that are very suspicious um, totally. in terms of what they were actually doing. And so I think they were like the, the footmen or the infantry of this, whoever was behind the reset. And um, there were a lot of fraternal order, brotherhood type, type groups, different names that all seem to be doing the same kind of thing. So, um, so anyway, this is just another example. I mean, it looks, it looks very similar. It, it does. And 
and running and water down. Fort? Sorry, I was just going to say running water down across all that crystal filled rock. I mean, oh, that's going to create something, isn't it? Current, maybe water has current. <laughs> And I also remember the guide under the tunnels talking a little bit about water in the moats. That that just didn't make sense that he said it was built on a on a swamp and then they dug tunnels everywhere underneath it. I'm like, I'm thinking, um, shouldn't they just fill up with water then? So this this is the associative way my mind works. <laughs> <laughs> I see the Starfort wall on one side, and I said, wait a minute, that reminds me of this dam and reservoir in england hmm. um but again these are just teeny tiny examples of countless examples and before i leave nobi Sad, i want to talk a little bit about um the city center that we visited yep. and oh before i go on from here um so again you've got quite a distance between novi sod and where the derwent reservoir is you know so again they're very similar in design features and they're very far apart and i couldn't help but notice that the tallest points of the biggest buildings in the town center lined up with each other so that's another thing that I look for. And there were quite a few domes in the on the buildings around the square. And so on this side, we have the city hall. And on the other side, we have what's called the name of Mary Church. And the, the towers would have served as antiquitech. Yeah. So there's the town hall. Um, there was said to have been built in 1895 and an, ex an example of neo-Renaissance architecture that came from a competition in 1855 mm -hmm. in which all the builders of the Austrian Empire could compete. Of course it came so from This is another typical story. <laughs> so a lot going on in the 1850s. You see a lot of 1854s, 1855s, 1859s. A lot of design competitions. Yeah. And what's interesting about this story, um, first of all, in one article, the winner of the competition was a German construction worker, Georg Molnar, who completed a building with four domes, a bell tower, and a balcony. The bell was named Matilda by the citizens, and it was used as a fire alarm until it was remelted in wartime. But there's another, so this was the, you know, you can see the German construction worker, Georg Molnar. Then I found another reference saying a Hungarian architect, Molnar Georgi, was the architect. Oh. Same year, 1895. And that the same Hungarian architect was responsible for the name of Mary Church across the city square from the town hall. And so um, here we go. Georgi Molnar, Hungarian architect, designed the church in 1892 for free. So they demolished the old church that year and they started the new one. And it was completed in 1893. So these are the stories that were told about how these buildings came into existence, and they can't even keep their story straight on who built it. And so, inside the the church of the name of Mary in Novi Sad, you find with the nave, the main part of the church where the congregation sits, looks the same as the Seville Cathedral in Spain, which was said to have opened in 1519. The Duke University Chapel in Durham, North Carolina, which opened in 1935. And you've got the same kind of vaulting effects going on here. 
and then the Christ Church in Dublin, Christ Church, the Christ Church Cathedral in Dublin, Ireland. So that was founded in 1030 AD, we're told, but it was extensively renovated between 1871 and 1878. So what was interesting about the Christ Church Cathedral in Dublin is that the architect who was credited with it, with the renovation was George Edmund Street. And the renovation was financially sponsored by Henry Rowe of Mount Anvil, a distiller and brewer from Dublin. A distiller and brewer from Dublin. Hey, Micah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> and again, you've got stories like that that just fill the oh, literature. They're everywhere. Looking for information on these places that. Yeah. It's like the Crystal Palace in London was designed by a, a gardener. <laughs> Joseph Paxton. Yep. And they put it all together very quickly. Huge place with railroads and they were all done and they moved it <laughs> <laughs> they in moved. 1854. <laughs> yeah. It just happened to look different when they rebuilt it, right? <laughs> <laughs> so the stories don't hold hold water and no. like a thousand years we've example. got there a thousand years difference in the in the build dates from those four pictures and they're almost identical it's crazy and like you mentioned before the ceilings are called vaulted ceilings right yeah like vaults voltage and that's what that's and what I didn't even... to do is change the spelling a bit, right? I just take out the O and put an AU in there and everyone mm -hmm. can't see what's going on. Yeah. That's a great catch. <laughs> Bolted. <laughs> so, yeah, there's an energy function going on with these as well. And there's also a musical function and frequency function. I didn't touch on the, the organs here and the bells, but they all had those equipped or they were all equipped with those and they would have been serving a purpose on the grid system because cathedral windows um rose windows look like solfeggio frequency patterns yep. and again i think cymatics go back to the design of the star forts yep. um a lot of window shapes look like antenna it has it has a relationship with frequency Yep. Um, so there's a much different function that these buildings are performing. Yeah, even the, even the um, floors, the tiling underneath a lot of the domes, um, some of them look exactly like a, a digital antenna. Mm. They do. They do. So very high technology, advanced engineering and circuitry going on here that they're keeping from us yeah just a question while we're on here like i've always wondered like these buildings everywhere do you think that they were made for people to inhabit or frequent or do you think they were machines probably both uh, my best guess would be they were serving some kind of harmonizing function for the community yeah i don't think they were used for the same kind of worship they're used for today i think people would come to these places and resonate together and mm. and probably heal together yeah um, well, it's where you went to, to feel god right to feel that connectedness of the all and I, I think they've just yeah sort of flipped that and gone oh no it's something outside of you now that you have to worship but i don't think that's what they were doing back in the day yeah, that, that would be my my best guess is that they were serving a a community function, but not a religious function. Yeah, yeah. Um, and maybe a community, yeah. you know, maybe a community spiritual kind of thing, but mm. but more like you said, that connection with each other and the all and and the universe. Because I really see the Earth as like a grand central station of the universe, and that these places and 
instruments for keeping harmony and balance, not only on the earth, but also it went out. And I think that's what the big bell towers are. I think they were um, sending these frequencies out. And, and so when the earth was attacked, you know, it also was an attack on everything. Yeah, I, sure. I, I see Earth as like a, a kingdom of heaven <laughs> of, on, in physical form. And that's why Earth was a prize and, and we're a prize because of who we are and we don't know who we are. You know, we're part of that. Yeah. That bigger being. And they've kept that awareness from us and subverted our energy and, and channeled it in other ways. And I find it miraculous that we're waking up at all, considering all that's taken place here. But we're still waking up in spite of that. Yeah, well, I mean, that that to me is one of the main reasons that I think this, all of this, this invasion, shall we call it, happened, didn't happen that long ago. I, I'm thinking 300 years max. Because Max. If, if they had thousands of years, we wouldn't be waking up. We'd be so indoctrinated, like, so full of chemicals that yeah so i think they're yeah we're talking uh probably 250 years since since the event and then it probably took them another 50 or 60 to start rebuilding and getting organized and everything and somewhere in there i mean whatever they did with the time manipulation and time distortion and i do have some ideas about how that took place but whatever they did with it it could have been even more recently than that. It could. At, at least, mm. at least in our historical narrative, the the controllers brought in their new world order, and I see the Crystal Palace exhibition that you mentioned as the official kickoff of their new timeline. Yeah, um, with Queen Victoria opening it and all the big wicks coming in and showing off the prior technologies, claiming it for themselves. And then for the next hundred years, the World's Fairs and exhibitions were a big deal, a super big deal. Yeah. And they had one every year, every couple of years, and had all these special occasions. And then they kind of petered off after about 1950. We've had World Fairs since then, but they weren't like the ones no. between 1850 and 1950. Yeah. Not and, well built so, anymore. <laughs> So, you know, definitely, definitely something else going on with those, but so eight, so <clears throat> somewhere in the mid to late 1700s was when things really started getting up and running and really between 1800 and 1900 in our narrative, they were setting the stage, bringing in their new um, system, new economic system you know, how they were going to be exploiting us. <laughs> um, you know, I think they, I think they destroyed the grid and then they had to replace it as soon as possible with like coal and, and other so-called natural resources. But I think they were part of the original system, uh, energy system as well, but they needed, they needed a new energy source and they needed it fast. And that was what really pushed their development of mines and getting, canals back up and running and getting railroads back up and running they were getting that replaced so they could make money and then when things were exhausted the resources were all dug out then they took the rail out and things like that so you see all the mining in australia and that story repeats itself everywhere yeah um, so it's like they knew where to go to get the resources that they were looking for. They definitely, just, especially in Australia, they definitely knew where to go because otherwise there's no way in the world they would have been finding resources, you know, within 50 years of landing here, right, and nothing being here. But they went straight to all the gold, straight to all the iron, straight to, you know, all these things. And, yeah, I think they were following old maps. And I think that... And they, they could possibly be old civilizations, right, that were melted, and, the, and that's where all the gold was. I, I think it's all in there, and, you know, there's massive holes in the open pit mining. You know, I've seen the ones in Australia. I've seen them everywhere. It's like these big, deep holes um, far north. 
across Sweden and and Russia and in North America, you just massive holes. And I have a lot of questions about where all that's going. And nobody knows about it. Nobody. Yeah, okay. It's a good I, you question. Know, I've done some stuff on mining and it's like. <laughs> it's a lot of material, isn't who's it? Who's using yeah. it? Yeah. It's a lot of material. Where do where? Where did all the stuff go? That, that, man, that's a good question. Just, just food for thought. Mm. Um, so anyway, um, those kinds of things come up and. You know, this, the Earth's story, our story is intrinsically connected to this energy grid. Not only what it was like before, but what's been going on ever since, which is exploiting the resources, exploiting us and our energy for the benefit of a few. And I don't even think they're human. Um, I agree. Very least parasites. <laughs> I just say they're not us. They're clearly not us, right? Not us. Mm. So their time's coming to an end, but they've had a field day for a long time. Yeah, man. And so we were t talking about Antiquitech. You know, I mentioned these spires at the top of these buildings would have been part of the energy system. And you see a lot of old buildings that are still standing that no longer have parts and pieces that they did at one time. Uh -huh. And again, I'm just pulling a couple of pictures. There's countless pictures to choose from. Now, these are the ones that are standing. A lot of them get torn down. But, mm. you know, some of them have survived. And uh, so this was in Salem, Oregon, and a grand theater there. Uh, it was an Odd Fellows building. And they're one of the ones that I mentioned as resetters. They have a very strange motto. <laughs> um, I don't know what it is at the moment. I've seen it. Yeah, I've, I, 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 sh I did have it memorized at one time, but it's like bury the dead and educate the orphan is part um, of it. Oh, wow. The distress. Very um, strange. Um, so they're part of that. Mm -hmm. um, and then this this is where I live in Prescott, Arizona. This is the historic Sacred Heart Catholic Church on the left and what it used to look like. And Prescott is so mud flooded. It's insane. You can kind of see it here. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, where you've got these rolly kind of streets and, you know, this is street level here and then this is street level down here. And, and this is a place I take people to show them how mud flooded it is. <laughs> um and you've got the the windows. I was talking about the cathedral rose windows, and these mm -hmm. type of windows here are, are like antenna. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, they they give some kind of reason, like it was struck by fire or some or lightning or something, so they had to take the steeple down. Um, and so it's it serves a different purpose today, but um, this is close to where I live. It just looks silly so, with the spire, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so back in Serbia, um, this is where we started. And then we traveled over to Belgrade to the fortress there and walked around there a little bit. And so there's a couple of things I want to point out about this location. Uh, Belgrade is the capital and largest city in Serbia and one of the continuously uh, one of the oldest continuously occupied cities in the world wow. and so like i said my my feeling that one point in time the railroad would have gone along the danube river here uh hard to find that kind of information out but i'm pretty sure that the railroad crosses here so this is where that bridge was or uh, no, the bridge was down here but anyway somewhere in here there's a rail connection between these two places yeah um, but i but i have found time tons of examples where the railroad goes right alongside the the river yeah yeah we saw we saw them when we were traveling around in bosnia and and you know out in the middle of nowhere kind of these clearly you know and, and through the mountains too like tunnels everywhere these arch tunnels and they just yeah in these countries that we're told we would never have the technology to make this kind of stuff and I would speculate that they were railroad tracks, railroad tunnels going through there. Uh, but they 
a lot of them have been turned into highways. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and Belgrade was so mud flooded. So here's a lot of the same stuff in Belgrade at the Belgrade Fortress. Um, you know, the same kind of brickwork in the entryway. These places had towers, um, clock towers and so forth, the same massive walls. And this is one of the outer walls and it reminds me of a building that I've seen in England and um, I don't have a picture of it here. I'm probably gonna put together another video with all this information and expand on it with just different compares, compar excuse me, comparisons of the same styles in different places. The other thing that was interesting about the Belgrade Fortress is that they have a Jurassic Park exhibit there. Yes. <laughs> a big one. A big run. Yeah. And then when I was look at, looking at the Bortange Fortress, they have the same kind of thing there. Oh. So what's that all about, the dinosaurs? Teaching us <laughs> <asking>. real history. <laughs> <laughs> the kids say, you don't have to answer that because you probably don't know. But, you know, they, they put other energies at these places because there's something going on with the star forts as... Uh, an energy source of some kind and somebody left me a comment that it was like like ram with the computer and i don't know enough about that to to really speculate i just feel like these are batteries of some kind so there's maybe like computer <laughs> like a, a battery that's a, a computer of some kind i don't know but uh, well, uh, well i mean they they're full of you know, there's crystalline rock and, you know, cement and more everywhere, right? And that holds memory. So, uh, yeah. I wonder if we can download the information from a star fort. <laughs> I think there's technologies that existed. I mean, I hear things like that about crystals, um, mm. even like crystal skulls. Yes. Or some kind of computer bank. So it would not surprise me at all if there was some high tech stuff just in that respect alone. Mm. Yeah, I mean it's all all high tech, but just not from our perspective, right? With what we've been taught. We we think bricks and mortar. We don't see that as as tech, even though now they're 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 telling us, right, that you can use red bricks as batteries. You know, so all this stuff's coming out, but yeah, we've just been given the perspective. It's just old. It's just bricks and mortar, and that doesn't mean anything. And yeah, they've they've done a job on us. They used to control the narrative, but not anymore. Thank goodness. <laughs> so this is the walk into the Belgrade Fortress, and you know, again, you've got the rail nearby. And this is, we're going to cross over the street. This is where that location is right here, going across to the fortress. Yep. And then there's, you know, tram stops here, but I just wanted to show that there's a railroad presence here. Oh, yeah, okay. Making a presence. circuit around it, yeah. And then the other thing that struck me about this location, um, you can see it better here, is that the Belgrade Fortress sits where the Danube goes one way and the Sava River goes another way. So it's at the confluence of, of these two rivers. And I see that a lot. I see these star forts in locations just like the one in Belgrade. And I gave an example of Fort Pitt and Fort Duquesne at the forks of the Ohio and Pittsburgh. And um, you, know, you see the same idea Move that over here. Um, where you can see the outline of star forts here, which is reflected in this map up here. And you've got three rivers here. So you've got, or that's what they call it, um, the Ohio, the Mon Monongahela, and the Allegheny. 
looking very nice and neat here in this picture. And you've got the bridges, you've got stadiums down here, and that's another whole nother story. Um, Pittsburgh was a major place in the development of this new system, whether steel or finance or coal. Uh, Pittsburgh was a big part of the controller story when they were setting up everything. A lot going on here. Mm. Yeah, I, I noticed like years ago as well when I was sort of in my earlier days, um, you have all these spirits, but you also have in a lot of um, islands in the rivers near Star Forts that, and I was always wondering why there are always islands in the middle of the river and is that the same kind of thing? It's splitting the current somehow or creating two currents, you know, maybe the positive, the negative, something like that. want to give some examples of that. Um, so this is a railroad junction, Monocacy Junction from 1872. And then here's this junction in Des Moines, Iowa of the yeah, Des Moines nice. and Raccoon River. So yeah. it looks the same. Yeah, yeah. Like a junction. And that's another uh, term junction that you find box. in junction box, yeah. In looking at the electrical terminology, um, you can make a connection to an energy function as well. And a junction is defined as an act of joining or adjoining things. And that implies intentionality as opposed to something that just happens randomly. And, and these are, I've seen this everywhere also. That's, yeah, river that's... confluences, but it's all natural. Mm. That's what they <laughs> no. want us to believe. That's what, yeah, exactly. Nature that, that's, amazing. That's very similar. Like, and yeah, because obviously, water, current, you know, that's what we call the flow of water is the current. And yeah, back to the trains, like all train tracks are, are metal, right? Iron. Um, with these, at least back in the day, the big old full metal trains and, and train engines traveling along them. So, could definitely be the same function, right? Yep. And, and you, I know you look at words and etymology a lot, um, like with the vault and the vault. I've been looking at words that end in ION. Yes, I got into that a couple of years ago. The <laughs> ions, man. Elect ion. <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Elect the ion, right? Elect, like, and it, um, gosh, I don't have anything up because an ion is basically um, like the the energy point, right? That's where it, it's basically yeah the the starting energy point. So and it's on so many words. So yeah, election is to elect energy basically to elect a certain energy, and it's just all through our language. It's yeah. Sorry, you keep going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and like in this example, you have. Uh, Junct ion. Junct. Conjunct ion. Con yes. Oh, so, so conjunct so is to join. Is is junct to unjoin? Do you know? I'm not, not I'm really sure. That. It's, it's, it's kind of junk, some hints in there about junk, what, yeah, they're, what they're keeping from us. Because in both these pictures, it looks like it's splitting, right? It's, yeah. So that would be a junk, like to, to unjoin rather than to conjunct. Yeah, Interesting. Pittsburgh there. So again, this is, these are just a couple of examples of, of many. And then I gave the example of Pensacola and um, there's a lot of star forts in Pensacola. So we've got Fort Pickens here, which is the one on the far right. There's pretty typical looking star fort. And Fort Barrancas is here across Pensacola Bay. And it's still intact. And then you have this place called Advanced Readout here. And that's all around the Naval Air Station in Pensacola, which is a big naval base there. And that's and, down on the uh, Caribbean. Uh, is that what it's called? Uh, 
the Caribbean, is that what it's called? In the Gulf, the Gulf. It's off the it's off the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah, yeah. It's um it's in western Florida. And I'm going to I'm getting close to the end of the, the PowerPoint here, but uh, this is a this is a good example because there's a lot of of star forts here in this one location. And what I said earlier about the star forts being a battery and a battery is defined as a device that produces electricity that may have several primary or secondary cells arranged in parallel or series and that they provide a source of energy which provides a push or a voltage of energy to get the current flowing in a circuit. And so if you find one star fort somewhere, there's probably been at least one more historically. Yeah. And in some places there's quite a few that are still there, but I always look for more when I find one. And oh. while there's a lot of star forts that are acknowledged and known and documented, um, there's a ton of star forts that don't exist anymore. And you yeah. really have to dig to yeah, find out. A about lot them. of them are quarries and, and like mines, aren't they? Yeah, they are. They're, they're they're still being used for energy sources. Mm. I've I've seen examples of ones like in New York state off of the Hudson river that you can tell it was a star fort, but it's got all the top surface peeled off of it, you know, and they're clearly harvesting it. Harvesting something. Yeah. yeah. Um, just, those, just a quick those... comment too. Have you ever thought about the, the um, connection between golf course and golf as in the Gulf of Mexico? I think there's connections. Like what's a gulf? It's like a chasm, right? Yeah. <laughs> mm. Basically. <laughs> um yeah, I think there's a lot of stuff. And I'm gonna end up with what I think probably happened and what we see, and it's I think it's very different from what the earth's surface used to look like. Um yes. but there's this is the example of Fort George in Pensacola, where there's a little bit left. You can find it. There's a you know a couple of walls. It's right across from this big church over here. Mm -hmm. Looks like a nice one, like a basilica or something. And then there was the Fort of Pensacola, which used to look like this, but it doesn't exist anymore. I was able to find the location from the coordinates. And it would have been here in Pensacola. So that's what's there now. And when I'm looking up, this is when I started to get the aha that there was really a connection with the star forts and railroads because just a couple of blocks south of where the star fort was, you have the rail yards here. And then if you compare that with a circuit board diagram, the rail yards look very similar. Yes, I do. And, yeah. and so, you know, it, part of the journey of the developing a lot of information just from the research that I've done already, um, you know, how I came into the whole idea of the circuit board earth and that kind of thing, you know, and, and other people have looked at that as well. Um, I w I've just put together some pieces over the years with a lot of different examples of how everything in existence seemed to be perfectly placed on the earth serving some kind of function and the narrative just doesn't can't even explain how that happened <laughs> not at all i mean it's the whole precision isn't it like of the old world that just that's and what they built but it's all just so precisely laid out and even the buildings are just so, you know, precise, right? All the windows are on top of each other, all the same sizes. Like it's just the symmetry is crazy. Um, do you think that that we are now part of this system, like walking around in cities and things? I think that's what the matrix is. 
I think they replaced the free energy generating system with our energy. Mm -hmm. So when they took out the rails and replaced it with roads and trails. Okay. So it, instead it, of the train carrying kind the of charge, energy. it's us. Yeah, I believe that. Wow. I believe that's what they did. I mean, how did we get to this place of this existential threat and transhumanism and all that other stuff? I mean, they've been hurting us or pushing us, the controllers who see us as their herd in this direction of, we don't know of our energy and our, our source power, you know, our connection with our, our creator. We don't know we're directly connected to that. They do. And they need source energy. They need our energy to survive because they are not, they don't have that. And so they have to get it synthetically. And so, you know, again, I, I see their, their time coming to an end, but I think they got darn close to achieving their goals. But I don't see that as our end. I see a, a big, better future for us than what was planned is my, my take on what's going on in the world today. Yeah, um, I agree. And, oh. it, it, and it's crazy, but, you know, things are, we're seeing things. Like, for the first time, we can, like, read the book. We can read the playbook. We can see it happening in real time. We know what they're doing. And while there's a portion of the population that's still asleep, when you realize the length and the extent of what they've done to control our world and our reality and how we see things and, you know, programming us and... Um, distracting us and you know in order to live you have to work and earn money and you know you can live beyond your means with a charge card um you know they've they've set this system up and you know i you know i think we're we're getting to a place where we can start to dismantle that but it takes, but it has taken us waking up in larger numbers than was possible before. And there's a lot of people that are still asleep. You know, we're so, not quite there yet. Yeah. Yeah. I had to go to a doctor's surgery yesterday and there's still people in masks and someone came up <laughs> next to me to check their, their child's jabby wabby test. I mean, I was just like, oh my God, yeah. get me out of here. <laughs> Crazy. I have to say though, I was, I was, I realized when I went to my, my bank the other day that they had taken the plastic or the plexiglass down finally. Nice, finally. <laughs> so you can actually see the tellers without the plexiglass. I thought that was interesting. That was uh, Wells Fargo here. And so made a lot of you know, money think... with those plexiglass wind screens or whatever, didn't they? Someone made a fortune. Yeah, it's pretty insane. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll see. I mean, things are still playing out and we'll see what happens. But I'm optimistic and I'm going to stay optimistic. Um, and, yeah. you know, you and Kelly and everybody that's doing the work to bring information back in is so important. It's all part of it. Mm. and yourself and of course for everyone watching i'll leave if you haven't got um if you haven't subscribed to michelle already i'll leave the link below go down and, and check out her stuff um but yeah it, it's interesting i always think that that the internet was it just got away from them i think that it was you know they brought it out for nefarious reasons and for control and that which obviously clearly they that it, it is as well um but i, I don't think they expected us to start using it for our own means and to start spreading the truth. And now they're in a, a position where it, looking, you know, looking at the show going on, it seems that every move they make is not working anymore. Where before, whatever move they made would just go straight through and no one would even know anything had happened. But now everyone's just on everything, right? They're researching, they're putting up their stuff on the internet, getting it out. And so the, I agree that, that yeah, I think, 
we're going to win this and and you've got to be optimistic anyway really because otherwise what's the point like you're just going to mope around all day like someone controls me I'm a, I'm a tax slave uh, I mean, that that's that's a worse life than, than having rose colored glasses in my opinion yeah right and that's and that's why we have to keep doing this and no fear and one foot in front of the other and and keep doing it because it's reaching people and I think more and more people are hungry for information and truth and realizing things don't add up. Um, there's just a two slides I want to end this with. Mm -hmm. um, so this is Hobart in Tasmania. And again, you have the multiple batteries and, and star forts here, not too far from where you are. Yep. And they look like the other forts that we were talking about. <laughs> Exactly. Like showed you in Pensacola. In Australia. Yeah. Um, and th these are just a few. I've, there's plenty oh, around. Oh, Sydney oh. Harbour is just chock full of them. That's crazy. And, and the thing is with Star Forts is the story, you know, the, the, the mainstream narrative says that basically what they were built between the 1500s and about 1750 by French and Italian as far as I can work out, roaming <laughs> stone mazes who just kind of walked around and built these these things. But when you get to Australia, you know, they, they tell us there was no white people here till 1788, no technology, no nothing. So, like, it's a complete anomaly in Australia. Like, they can't explain any of these star forts, but they're clearly star forts. And if you look at Tasmanian hist the history <laughs> since European colonisation, um, there is an extensive railroad history there in Tasmania. Yeah. And a lot of those rail trails that I was talking about where they were turned into recreational trails, um, they might have a little bit of a track that's used for like uh, tourist attractions and things like that, but they took that out as well. So yeah it, it just doesn't add up and i just wanted to end with um places like this um so you've got the white cliffs of dover here around this on the english channel and then you've got the australian coast yeah the great and um and the 12 apostles uh you've got the lighthouses here this is the coast of england down here and you've got the lighthouses here and i'm my thought, my belief is that the land just sheared off at places like this, and you know, where there were rails and and the lighthouses. I don't think were what we're told. I think they became that. Yeah, they're right next to the water. That's for sure. You know, guide ships through dangerous reefs, um, but I think they had a much different function. Um, with the energy grid having to do with light, light frequencies, light energy. And that, um, again, this is just a couple of examples. I've got more mm. of where I think the land just, just it, something happened, some kind of attack. My feeling is it was an attack um, that mm. caused the land just to fall off into the water. And then you see places, I mean, even looking at Google Earth, you can see shallow areas mm, um, yeah right yeah 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 and, so and especially in australia that they are just sheer cliffs and they're pretty big too and most of that area in australia is is out of bounds you're not allowed to go there you're not definitely not allowed to fly drones anywhere around there um, there's a military presence so it's for just you know like a piece of land in the middle of nowhere they you know why would they be cordoning that off right that's there's a lot of questions there's actually places in australia that are off bounds that are bigger than the uk like like just individual areas you can't go in and if you drive the Stewart highway through the middle of australia darwin to alice springs there's signs everywhere saying you're not allowed to leave the road and and but they tell us it's just a desert right there's nothing there so it's it's pretty interesting so the Vatican Library has nothing on Australia. <laughs> it's the same idea. I mean, nope. We got all these books hidden away. <laughs> Too bad. So sad. Sorry. We're not going to tell you what's in there. 
<laughs> yeah, unless you know the special handshake, yeah. <laughs> you can't come in. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like the controllers think we're just like really stupid, and cheap, and controllable, and you know, maybe to a certain extent we are or have been, but they can't keep the wool pulled over our eyes forever, as hard as they try. And I think they've known that, which is why they've kept throwing things at us. Yeah, yeah. But no, I agree. I think they've lost lost grip. They've lost control. Um, we're waking up and, you know, even with all the stuff they throw at us, right, all the, the education and all the media and all the poison in the food and the water and the, like they, they still can't stop us. So <laughs> they must be pretty annoyed with us, which, which is good to think about. <laughs> good <laughs> yeah, man. that's nothing compared to what's coming man awesome man well that was really cool so basically what you say and, and i would agree and i think i'm pretty sure that you were the first person i saw who put out the circuit board um you know worldwide grid theory um it yeah it, it looks like where they've replaced this old world system for basically things they can charge. There's that word again, right? They can charge us for like electricity and petrol and, and that, then they can manipulate that, which is happening at the moment. And, and when it comes back to it, as long as we keep buying into this and relying on the system, we're, we're giving them power, right? Power over us, like literally. So it's, I think it's, you know, a lot of people have woken up, but, you know, if everyone watching, the main thing you, that, you know, you can do if, if you're not creating stuff is just share this stuff around, right? Get it out there because, like Michelle said, a lot of people suddenly got questions, you know, suddenly things aren't making sense. And so, you know, the, the better information and the better questions we can get to them, then the, the faster this all goes as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I, I agree, Campbell, and it's happening. It's not happening as fast as I would like. <laughs> But <laughs> I'm starting to see, I'm starting to see signs that um, some things I've been hoping for for quite some time are, are actually happening, and that remains to be seen. I, I think between now and the end of the year, we'll know for sure, one way or the other. But I'm going to yeah, remain optimistic. I hope so. I, I'm, I'm well over it. I'm like you, man. I've been waiting for God, I've been waiting for yeah. decades. Well, you've been awake really. for a long time. <laughs> I, I would say been. I've been wide awake since 2012. Yeah. Mostly awake since 2012 and wide awake since 2016. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Uh, because it was between 2012 and 2016, I learned how dark the dark was. And, and this is really, so that's, I was just going to say, that's the thing that stops most people from waking up. I think they don't want to go there. They don't want to look at the dark and they don't want to admit that, it's here and that not everyone's like a good person like them, which is weird because everyone will always say there's bad people and look, look at the bad stuff, but they don't, they don't want to um, personalize it, right? That it's, it's actually real and, and part of their reality. And so it's just like oh, too scary, but I mean, knowledge is power, right? Really in the end, as long as you don't let it suck you down, then it's, it's just information that, that empowers you. Exactly. You know, I mean, I've often wondered, or, or in a way wished I didn't know the worst of it. And I probably don't know the worst of it. What I know is bad enough. Mm. But it's part of this. Not everybody's going to want to know that. But in order to understand what's happened here, it has to be understood. Mm. And, and that's why history and is... To for me is such a good topic and I'll turn, if you can show people that our history is has, has on purposely been changed and it's all a lie then that can be enough to, to wake people right up you know without having to go down these these dark rabbit holes because I mean I don't like I don't think anyone likes it really I kind of peek in and get it get an idea and then I, that's enough for me I can I can see the picture and okay I, I get it but I don't need to go into the details of it all <laughs> yeah i'm like you i know they're there and even in the course of doing the research um you stumble across those holes and 
sometimes it's information that just has to be brought out. Okay, this is what it looks like happened. Mm. And, and it's not pretty. And, you know, what they've been hiding from us about our history, especially in the last 200 years since the reset started, as we were talking about, you know, when, what exactly happened here um, is not nice. And, you know, the insane asylums and the wars and what was really going on. Um, I mean, even looking at, at Sydney and the town hall, which has an interesting story. It looks just like the one in Philadelphia and one in Leeds in England. Um, big organ in the Sydney town hall. What does a town hall need an organ for? Yeah. Beautiful organ. Um, was said to have been built on top of the old burying ground as same thing with the train station in Sydney. I think the bodies were already there. That that would be my assessment at this point. The buildings were already there. And when they talk about a burying ground, I would say there was probably corpses there. And that's why they called it that. Mm. I don't think those buildings were built by the people that took credit for them. And I think if there was a, a graveyard or a cemetery there, it probably came with the real estate. Yeah. Yeah. Be my guess at this point. Left over from the destruction. Yeah. Very that's, that's doing, where, very where my bodies. research is leading me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So there's just a whole bunch that's that's been covered up. And, you know, if you really get down into the major wars um you know you've got the the elites financing both sides and a lot of this free energy beautiful architecture being destroyed infrastructure being destroyed i think that was what was going on in the balkans with the wars there all of them you know not just the ones in more recently that were so destructive but also world war ii and you know, it's like they were targeting certain places Dresden. Dresden, that's what came into my mind. Yep. <laughs> you know, boom, bombarded. Um, you know, so there's, so that what seems to be what was really going on. And in the meantime, people were losing their lives. And, and in a collaboration that I'm doing with a, another researcher, he's not a YouTuber, but he does great research on the earth grid, are fighting you know, civil war battles and world war one battles on these grid lines and concentration camps and other things i just put up a video today looking at that whole issue and that's we're just starting to do this work so there's a lot more to come out how it looks like um these battles and s s department stores like walmart's and insane asylums and all these places are on these alignments these ley lines and, and that seems to have been done on purpose for the same energy harvesting re reason that we were talking about yeah. with the matrix and, you know, replacing mm. the original free energy with human energy. Makes That's sense, really right? Like. Shopping, where you go and get your possessions. Go and get possessed. So. <laughs> yeah, so they, they have to tell us what they're doing. So they tell us in movies, they tell us in language. They've given us the clues. <laughs> it's on us if we can't figure it out. Yeah. yeah. So they yeah. so they believe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they get their karmic get out of jail free pass. Uh, yeah. Get get their karmic get out of jail free pass. Yeah. 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 We told them. We destroyed them, but we told them we would. We gave them a chance. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure if that's going to work for them somehow. Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> Awesome. Well, awesome. That was really cool. Thank you very much for that. And and we finally got to to get out the, the slides that, that were organized for the tour. But um, yeah, so everyone... Like them, a, not all of them. Not all of them, some of them. Um, so yeah, um, maybe we should have another chat in the future sometime. It would be cool. But everyone, if you're not subscribed to Michelle, like I said, um, I'll leave the link to her channel uh, below in the description. Go across and check out her work and, and share it around, um, you know, because... Michelle's one of the best researchers out here in, in this field. Um, does a thorough job making lots of connections. So, you know, it's it's really worth checking out and sharing around just to, to get people to go, hmm, really? 
just get a, get a new question, right? And then then let's let them go off by their by themselves. <laughs> You know, and I just want to say again, it's such an honor and pleasure knowing you and Kelly and supporting you in your work. Um, you know, we're, we're all, I believe, doing what we came here to do. And it's not an easy job, is it? <laughs> it's not an easy job, but it's very rewarding. Exactly, exactly. There's, there's a few, few uh, potholes along the way that they can... <laughs> That can break your wheels, but um, yeah, no, it's. I mean, you know, what, what's what's the alternative, Michelle? What are we going to go and do? Get a nine to five job? <laughs> Come <It's>... on, <laughs> no, nah. here to save the world. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's exactly <laughs> right. That's that's it. Mm. You know, I I um I I can't see a better use of my time, and um, I don't see any end to it either. This topic's what four or five years. I mean, it's probably ten or twelve, but like as far as YouTube, really four or five years, and it's only just starting to gain traction now. So yeah, we're just we've only just scratched the surface. So, and that's the other thing about sharing this information around is we get everyone else's input, right? Everyone else has different ideas and sees things that we don't see, and it just helps the whole story come together. So, so yeah, we we definitely need to get this info out there. Yeah. I would be honored to come back. So just awesome. let me know what your schedule's like in the coming months. Awesome. I will call it a day then. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, I suppose it's getting late there in, in uh, the USA. So we'll, we'll let you go and get some sleep and I'll be in touch and we'll hook something up for the future. That sounds great, Campbell. Awesome. It's, it's, I still got another hour or so before it's bedtime. But... Oh, there we go. A bit more research to <laughs> it... do. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of your day. I will. Thank you. You too. Thanks, everyone. We'll talk Thanks. to you all on the next upload. Bye. Bye for now. Bye, everyone. Remember in the end, nobody wins unless everybody wins. Come on! Oh,